Now we want to be able to run the hypothesis test for the difference between two proportions. This is our last hypothesis test for this chapter. This is going to be called a two-prop Z test when we get to the calculator. And keep in mind this is always for proportions for independent samples. Just a side note is that we're not going to actually do um, basically step three by hand. We're going to use the calculator and or read computer outputs for it. And that's because this formula right here with this extra formula added on the side is basically just really tedious. It's not that it's super hard, but it's just annoying. So we just kind of gloss over it and have the calculator or the computer do all the heavy mathematical lifting for us, if you will. All right, so the requirements to conduct this test are, of course, that your samples have to be independent. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an independent sample test. And they have to be, um, the samples have to be found with simple random sampling, which is pretty typical. Independence and simple random kind of go together a lot. Then you need n times p times 1 minus p to be greater than or equal to 10 for both samples. And that makes sense because that ensures normality. When we saw in chapter 10 single proportion tests, we said that that same condition, but we set it only for a single value because we only had a single population we were dealing with. Similarly, we had this n less than or equal to 0.05 capital N, but only one of them because you were only working with one single proportion, one single sample. But now we're dealing with the difference between two groups, the proportion of men that think this and the proportion of women that think this, that kind of thing. And so you need to have both the first group and the second group um, satisfy both of those same conditions from chapter 10 in order to ensure normality with the case of n times p times 1 minus p greater than 10 and independence in the case of the sample size being less than 5% of the population size. Then we have our null and alternative hypotheses, and they look really familiar because they look a lot like the ones we saw in 11.3, except in 11.3 they were mu's because you were talking about the mean, whereas in this section they're proportions because you're talking about p for proportion. And then alpha, everybody's favorite step, and then the test statistic, we're just going to use the calculator to do it for us. It's just too annoying on its own to do. All right, and then we have the same steps four and five and six that we've had all along. Just remember, this is a normal distribution now, um, not a t-distribution, not a chi-square distribution. It's a normal distribution, which you can get your values from using inverse norm or the bottom row of your t-table. Never forget that the bottom row of the t-table, here's the t-table, very bottom row is some z-values. It's not all the z-values known to man, but it's a few of them that we use pretty often. All right, so let's run this. And then that's the calculator instructions. And bear with me, please, because my computer ate my video. So I've already made this entire video and I've lost it. So the apnea of prematurity occurs when premature babies have shallow breathing um, or stop breathing for more than 20 seconds. One therapy for this condition is to give caffeine to the premature infants kind of stimulate them, see if they can breathe more. Medical researchers conducted an international study in which one sample of premature infants was randomly assigned to receive caffeine therapy, and another sample received a placebo therapy. Researchers compared the rate of severely negative outcomes, death, and severe disabilities in the two groups to determine whether the caffeine therapy would lower the rates of such bad events. The caffeine group included 937 infants, of which only 377 suffered from death or disability. The placebo group had 932 infants, of which 431 suffered um, death or disability. All right, so I'm going to let caffeine group be group one for no good reason. I just did. And if I do that, then P1 hat is X1 over N1, which is 377 right here over 937, which is about 0 0.402 on the calculator. Then the other group is 431 out of 932, which gets you about 0.462. All right, now let's look at the graph here. So we have the graph at right um, shows the proportions, the relative frequency for bad outcomes and good outcomes for both the caffeine group and the placebo group. So you can see the bad outcomes here, caffeine group, good outcomes over here, and vice versa. So does there appear to be a significant difference in the two groups? And the answer to that is yeah, yeah, there does appear to be a, a big difference. And that's because the height difference in the bars, so the, the differences in the bar heights, appears much more pronounced in the caffeine group. That's kind of a sign that something's going on with this caffeine group that is significantly different than that placebo group. 
In other words, the proportion of good results in the caffeine group appears to be a significantly different um, proportion than the proportion of good results over here, or vice versa. The proportion of bad results um, appears to be very different. So there's a more pronounced, more marked difference over here on the caffeine group than there is in the placebo group. So now we think there's going to be a difference, but now we have to prove it using a, path, a hypothesis test um, to determine whether that caffeine therapy is effective at the 0.01 level of significance using the p-value method. All right, we have to start with our hypotheses. We assume that the caffeine group and the placebo group are equal to each other. And just remember that the caffeine group goes in front because the caffeine group is group one. You do not have to use the ones and twos. I know that the test when I write it up here has ones and twos, but if you have words that make it make more sense, then use the words, right? That Otherwise you lose track of what's one and what's two and what's going on. So caffeine is group one, placebo is group two. They're equal to each other in the null hypothesis, as always. Then we think that the caffeine will lower the rate of the bad outcomes. So we think caffeine is lower than placebo. Now be careful in this chapter, as usual, if it's if the word lowering appears, that doesn't mean that it's always going to be a less than test. It depends on which group you make group one. If I made placebo the group one, then this would actually have been a right-tailed test because you'd reverse the sign down here in the alternative hypothesis. So be extra, extra careful. The hypotheses in chapter 11 in particular are really weird. All right, step two is everybody's favorite step. That's alpha. Alpha is 0.01. It says it right here. Level of significance. There's your alpha. Okay, step three. Oh, why does it keep doing that? Sorry. Step three. Your Z0, I get out of the calculator. Now, how do I do that? So I went to stat, I go to tests, and I pick number six. Number six is the two prop Z test. See right there? And then I typed in my numbers. X1, if you remember, was, here it's right here, 377. N1 was 937, X2 is 431, N2 is 932. And then you got to be careful, but you wanted a left-tailed one on this particular example, so you went with the middle one. Then you go down to Calculate and press Enter. And if you'll notice, it actually finds P1 hat 0 0.402 and P2 hat 0 0.462. This calculator stuff is so handy. And then right there is the Z-score, negative 2.63223. And while I'm on the subject, look at the plain P. That plain P is your p-value, 0 0.0044. It's not p1 hat or p2 hat. Those are sample proportions. It's not p1 and p2. Those are the population proportions assumed. It's p, plain p, that's your p-value, which is important since we're doing the p-value method. So that's where my test statistic comes from. It's the z in there, negative 2.63223. Then my p-value method means I'm going to have to draw a curve, a normal curve at that. And I'm doing the left-tailed test. So I'm going to do the middle graph here. Put zero, Z0 zero down and label my p-value. So I did that. So I have Z0, which is negative 2.6223. And the p-value that went with it is 0 0.0044. Again, it's right there, 0 0.0044. And this means you're going to reject the null hypothesis because we always reject when our p-value is low. And the lower, the better. We always want the p-value as low as it can go because that means you're more likely to reject the null hypothesis. So we reject because even though our alpha was pretty low, which is pretty common in a medical study, they want a low level of significance um, because they want to make sure they don't do a lot of false positives. But even with that, our p-value is below it. So we're rejecting the null hypothesis. That means that there is enough evidence to support the claim that the caffeine therapy is effective in lowering the death and disability rate of premature infants. Now, we could be wrong, but that's what it appears. All right, now to redo steps four and five, these two steps with the classical method, we need to redraw a picture, but it looks similar to the picture we drew, but it's not the same. It's left-tailed, but you label it with alpha, and you find negative Z alpha, that's your critical value, using either inverse norm or the bottom row of the T table. So, let's see here. Alpha, if you remember, was 0 0.01. So to find Z alpha, Z alpha, actually it's negative Z alpha. It's the inverse norm of 0 0.01, comma 0, comma 1. 
Oh my goodness, I can't type. There we go. All right, so let me grab the calculator. Inverse norm number three. Point zero one. Enter. Negative two point three two six. All right. All right. So there's my my critical value. Now I've got to draw the picture. There it is. So there's point zero one, and there's the negative z alpha. I couldn't draw an alpha there, but it's that a is an alpha. And that's negative 2.326. So again, we're going to reject the H naught. And that's this time it's because negative 2.623 is less than that critical value. Let me type that up. Nope, not there. There it is. Is less than our negative Z alpha, which was negative 2.326. And again, that's because this is a left tailed test. So what you're using is this rule right here. You reject the null hypothesis if your Z0 is less than your negative Z alpha. One other side note, you could have found it with the T table. Let me show you how. So we said alpha was 0.01. So you go to the 0.01 column, you drop to the very, very bottom, and it tells you it's 2.326. And then you have to know because of the drawing you did that it must be negative because it's a left tailed test right here. So since it's a left tail test, that negative Z alpha has got to be over there on the left. And you don't need to redo step six because it'd be the same thing you already said. And one last reminder, if you reject here, then you must reject here. So usually the p-value method is a little bit easier for folks. So if you do the p-value method and you see you should reject, then make sure you write something to the effect that you should reject here. And of course, as always, write all your information, all your steps, draw your pictures, label everything perfectly, including with Z's and alphas and stuff. All right, we're all done with that hypothesis test. I'll see you back here for more videos.